Good morning, everybody. I'm Dario Nisi, and today I'm going to talk about my latest work, Lost in the Loader, the many phases of the PE file format, a work that I conducted with Mariano Graziano and Yannick Fradantonio from Cisco Dallas and Davide Balzarotti from Eurecom, which is also my home institution. As the title may suggest, today we are going to talk extensively about the PE file format, so I think it's worth to give a little bit of background about it. The p-file format is the de facto standard for programs in Windows, and it is based on the old Microsoft DOS MZ and the COFF uh, file formats. The p-file format defines the headers, which are data, structure that data structures that we find at the beginning of each program for Windows. In fact, each program starts with the MZ header, which is there only for compatibility reasons nowadays. It's only used to locate in memory the starting offset of the COFF header. This other header contains generic information about uh, the program itself, such as the instruction set for which it is uh, compiled and uh, the file, whether it is an, a standalone executable uh, or um, dynamically linked lo library. After this UFF header, we find the optional header, whose name may actually sound a little bit misleading because this header actually contains vital information without which the operating system would not know how to load the program in memory correctly. Such information are, for example, the entry point, which is the address of the first instruction in the program, the section and file alignment, the base address at which the program prefers to be loaded, and the data directories, which have specific roles, um, which play specific roles uh, in loading the file um, in memory, such as the import table, the export table, relocations, and certificate table. After the optional header, we find the section table, which defines the program's memory image which means, which mm, represents how the program looks like once it's loaded in memory. Each entry in the section table defines a section, which is a contiguous and homogeneous portion of memory that shares the same permission level in terms of read, write, and execution. Each section has its own starting address and size in memory, its own offset and size within the file. The P file format supports up to 2 to the 16th power sections because 16 is the number of bits in the number of sections field in the uh, COFF header. Now, while we were studying the P ecosystem, we found two interesting things. The first is that there is not really a reference implementation for how to parse correctly the P file format. And the second observation that we made was that the specifications, although they make a very good job in defining the headers and their, their structure and their field and their possible values for each field, they are not really comprehensive. They do not tell what it is to be considered a valid P file or an invalid one, or, or at least they don't do it in all the possible circumstances. Now, when you take these two things together, some problems may start arising. For example, the fact that there is no really a reference implementation means that re-implementing the same logic over and over again is a de facto rule for the PE ecosystem. While the fact that these specifications are not comprehensive enough means that a lot of room is left for implementation choices. When you combine these two things together, you end up with discrepancies, which are slight differences in how two pieces of software handle the same file as a, given as an input. But are these discrepancies really a problem? Well, what are the implications of uh, P discrepancies? Well, let try, let's try to make a case for the severity of this problem by means of two examples. First, imagine that you have a program that runs under Windows 7, but not under Windows 10. Well, these of course already break backward compatibility, which is something for which Microsoft has spent a lot of development efforts to maintain throughout the versions. But it's even worse if you have a dynamic analysis sandbox which runs Windows 10. Well, suppose that you want to analyze this program because you suspect it's malicious. Well, your analysis sandbox simply cannot run, cannot analyze this program because it's only, it only runs under Windows 7. Another example, take your favorite reverse engineering tool and imagine that for this program, it gives you the wrong mapping. Now imagine that you are already working on reverse engineering this, this uh, uh, program uh, only to find out six hours later that you are, the, the mapping was wrong. Basically, you for six hours of your day, you were just staring at ghosts. 
This is even worse if the reverse engineering tool is used as a part of a study, can study analysis pipeline. Basically, each other analysis which rely on, the wrong, on this wrong mapping may be biased as a result. As you can, see, as you can already see, the P discrepancies are problematic, especially in adversarial settings like malware analysis and malware detection. Both static and dynamic approaches can be evaded using P discrepancies, and even um, endpoint protection software can be bypassed you know, through uh, P discrepancies. For example, um, just a few weeks ago, the Google Threat Analysis Group discovered malware families that were exploiting exactly something like this. Uh, in particular, they were exploiting how the operating system and OpenSSL parse the certificate table in a PE file. Since OpenSSL is used in a lot of uh, detection tools, this malware family was able to completely bypass the detection by these tools, while still being able to run under Windows. Now, our work is by no means the first one to tackle the problem of P discrepancies, but all these other works that have been published or have been conducted before only scratched the surface of the problem, in our opinion. They only documented single edge cases, and nobody really did a systematic study of this problem. And that's exactly what we did in our work. We provide a systematic approach to find discrepancies in the PE file for in the PE ecosystem. Let's have a look to the big picture of our work. We start with some software that we want to compare. We reverse engineer it to model their behavior, especially how they parse the PE file format. And then we feed these models to our analysis framework, which can operate in two modes. The first one is validation mode, which given an unknown P file and a model is able to tell us whether this unknown P file is valid or not according to the original software without running the software itself. The second mode of operation of our analysis framework is generation mode, which given the models can create automatically valid test cases, which are files that the original software would consider as valid. The generation mode is actually more powerful than that. It can also create differential test cases, which are files that are valid according to one of the original software, but invalid for another one. All right, let's now give a, a more in-depth look of the constraints modeling phase of our work. In this phase, we want to collect as much knowledge as possible about the operations that the original software performs on P files given as an input through their parsing routines. While we were performing this phase, we realized that there are three types of operations that software usually perform on the input files. And those are structural checks in which the software validates the file from a structural point of view. For example, they check that all the mandatory headers are within the file, that the magic numbers match, and everything on this line. Then we have compliance checks operations, in which the software validates the program from an operational point of view. For example, the operating system may want to check that the instruction set architecture of the program matches the one of the machine onto which it's about to run. The third type of operation are memory mapping, in which either the program is loaded in memory, as in the case of the Windows program loader, or the tool creates an abstract representation of how the program looks like when it's loaded in memory, such as in the case of reverse engineering tools. Now, it's important to highlight that all these three types of operation can be somehow deconstructed in a set of constraints on the original input. In order to um, easily um, encode these constraints, we created a language, a custom language. We have different types of statements in this language, and each of them try to solve one problem that may arise during the reverse engineering phase. The first type of statement is input declaration statement. Let's have a look to what we try to solve with input declaration statements. Here we have the original program that reads the input file from an external source. In our language, we model this with an input declaration statement in which we create a, a symbol of a symbolic variable. In this case, we call it input file 
that we then can use in our model. The second type of statement is symbol definition statement, with which we create new variables with mnemonic names whose values are, um, a set, are given by a set of mathematical operations on the input file. In the original program, for example, we have that uh, the original program we, is creating a new uh, variable called MZ header um, that is taken directly from the input file. We model this in our language by introducing a simple declaration statement. You see, we have the MZ header to which we assign the, um, a value which is computed using the original input file as an input. The third type of statement is our predicates. Predicates are Boolean formulas that can evaluate either to true or false. And these predicates can either be terminal or non-terminal. Terminal statements try to um, model those constraints that must be met by the original file in order to be considered uh, valid. For example, in the original program here, we see that it's, it, is trying, it is checking that the magic number in the MZ header is exactly MZ. We can model this in our language by introducing two terminal constraints. You see, the term keyword at the end of the statements is what, uh, it's what defined a predicate as terminal. Then we have non-terminal predicates in our language, and these are very useful as preconditions for conditional statements. Any type of statements in our language can be conditional. And the, the peculiarity of conditional statements is that they are only executed if their precondition is true. For example, in the original program here, we have that um, the software is checking that the section alignment is greater than a certain value. If this is the case, it will perform some operation operations. And at a certain point, it will check that the number of section is equal to zero. If that's the case, the file is considered invalid. We can model this in our language by first introducing a non-terminal uh, predicate. See that there is no term keyword at the end of the statement. And then a terminal statement, which is also conditional, in which we check that the number of section is not equal to zero. In our language, we also model, we also support loops, which came really handy to handle um, those constraints that the original software enforce on um, each entry of a table-like structure, such as the section table. We also support uh, structured types. And uh, the cool thing of our um, language is that you can define your structured types using C-like um, syntax. All right, let's now give a look to our analysis framework starting from the validation mode. In validation mode, we want to determine whether an input file is valid according to a model or not. And we can do that by means of the procedural interpretation technique uh, that consists in evaluating each statement of the model using the data from the input file. The file is then considered um, valid if all the terminal statements in the model are true and invalid if even one of those is evaluated to be false. Now let's move on to the generation mode. Generation mode is more complex than the validation mode. In fact, we start from some models, but we cannot really generate files directly from our models. We first need to translate them into something onto which we can work mathematically. And we do that by translating models into SMT problems. The SMT problems are then fed to the Z3 backend which is based on the, SM, on the Z3 SMT solver. The Z3 back, Z3 backend can perform a lot of tasks. For example, test case generation, differential analysis, differences enumeration, and corner case generation. Let's have a look to them. But first, let's have a look to the translation phase between models and SMT problems. The translation phase is based on the equivalence between each type of statement in our language and SMT problems and um, statements in an SMT uh, problem. Input declaration statements are translated into new unconstrained big vector. Symbol and predicates become new mathematical formulas to which we give mnemonic names. We handle loops by unrolling them up to a certain number of iterations and we translate structured types 
into offsets and slices in the original bit, bit vector. Once the translation is uh, finished, we take all the uh, pre uh, terminal predicates and we combine them together in logic conjunction. This creates the statement that the SMT solver needs to assert in order to solve the problem. Now, it's important to highlight that the solutions of an SMT problem um, created in this way are PE files that are valid according to the model. So they respect all the terminal predicates. All right, but how can we use these SMT problems for creating differential test cases? Suppose that we have two models that for which we want to create differential test cases. We take the first one, we translate it into its formula. We do the same for the second model. Then we take the two formulas and we apply this um, logic operation. We take the first, we do a logic end with the negated version of the second formula. This gives us a second SMT problem uh, whose solutions are files that respect all the terminal constraints of the first problem, but they break at least one of the constraints of the second problem. Actually, our analysis framework is also able to tell us automatically which are the broken constraints in the second model. This came really handy for when we were implementing the differences enumeration technique with which we want to find all the differences between two models. This is a heuristic iterative approach uh, in which for each iteration we solve an SMT problem that asserts some of the previously negated constraints in the second model. This drives the SMT solver to find new ways and new discrepancies between the two models. In our analysis framework, we also implemented the corner case generation technique, by which we create as many samples as possible that are also structurally different. To achieve that, we leverage the non-terminal statements in our models. For each iteration, in fact, we try to assert different combinations of non-terminal statements. These res result in files that are structurally different because the, um, the original software would would use different path in the in its code in order to validate them. Our analysis framework is also able to generate uh, samples that have customized um, uh, customized the code in um, once it, it's loaded in memory. We do so by adding constraints to the section content of the original sample, and. We were actually able to create samples that ex execute valid code with this technique, even an hello world um, sample. All right, let's have a look to some results and findings of our work. To begin with, we modeled this software and we compared these this, uh, software artifacts. The Windows program loader versions XP 7 and 10, both the kernel space and the user space component. We modeled Clima V specifically it's a PE parsing uh, format specific signature engine. Radari 2, specifically how it handled the memory mapping operations. And Yara, in particular, it's PE module. Our tool actually found discrepancies even between different versions of Windows. We found five of them in particular. Now, I don't have the time to go into details of all of them. I'll just mention one briefly, which I like the most. And it's uh, the one about the relocations. So basically, Windows XP and 7 allows executables to use any type of um, um, architecture-specific relocations, even though even if these are not actually supported by the uh, architecture on which the program is about to run. For example, in Windows XP and, and 7, you can use MIPS-specific relocations, even if you're running under Intel. Executables that do this are discarded by Windows 10 as invalid. Our tool also found discrepancies between Windows and ClaimAV. We found three of them in particular. Again, I don't have the time to ex explain all of them. Uh, we'll just mention one, which we, uh, we will see it's important in, uh, in a moment. It's about the number of sections. ClaimAV expects the file to have at most 96 sections, while Windows does not really have this constraint. All these three discrepancies uh, were acknowledged by the developers of Clima VS bugs, and they are working on some fixes. We also ran a differential analysis between the memory mapping operations of all this software, and we found one edge case that all the tools we analyzed handled um, incorrectly, in particular when the section alignment is smaller than the page size. 
executables with these characteristics are mapped by Windows directly in memory as they are, completely disregarding their section table. Radali, Yal, and Flema V, on the other hand, still infer the mapping of these programs using the section table. We could not find any documentation about this behavior, so we were not really surprised that the tools got this wrong. So I've looked to one notable test case that was created by comparing the memory mapping operations of Windows and Radari in particular. This is the optional header of this test case. As, as you can see, the section alignment is four, so it's smaller than the, the, the page size. The entry point is at this address, which means that the test case will execute these two uh, instructions, which are basically just a return zero in, uh, in C. This test case also have a, a one section, which start at this address. Now, you can notice that the section table and the optional header overlaps. Our analysis framework actually lo loves to do things like this that you don't really find in normal executables. Now, when you run this test case in Windows, you have something like this. So as you can see, these are the, the very same bytes that we saw before because the, pro the program is mapped in memory as it is. And in the last line, we can see that it's already executing the instruction, the first instruction that we, um, with which we um, customized the um, text code. When you open this in Radari, on the other hand, you find this. So Radar is not able at all to find anything once uh, the program is loaded in memory. All right, we found these discrepancies and we asked ourselves, is, it, is there any way to find out whether malware authors are already knowledgeable about them and if they are already um, exploiting them in the wild? To answer this question, we ran a, a virus total live hunt for which we created the error rules that match all the, dis the discrepancies we discovered um, in our work, except one of the relocation due to technical limitations of ER. We ran this campaign from the 7th to the 19th of October, and we estimate to have scanned something around 5 million samples during this period. Now, we were reported with, uh, we, we were prompted with uh, 467 samples that matched at least one of the Yara rules we provided. And it's important to highlight that all the rules that we provided match at least one sample. The most prominent about the um, discrepancies seem to be the one about the section alignment with 301 samples matching. This may trigger different mappings in the software. The second most prominent uh, discrepancy seems to be the one about the 96, 96 sections for claim of V with 77 samples matching the corresponding error rule. We actually analyzed some of them manually and we discovered that they had 97 sections exactly, which you know, uh, to us seems that it was probably done on purpose. All right, let's uh, now give uh, a few more words and a few takeaways from our work. So I believe that the most important lesson that we learned during our work is that there is not really one way to render the P file format. And even if you want to consider Windows as the reference implementation of how to parse the P file format, then you should also specify which version of Windows you take as a, um, a reference implementation. Because as we saw, all of them have small quirks and small edge cases that they handle uh, differently. We believe that we need more clear and more formal specification for the PE file format. And we also need a publicly available reference implementation, but this of course takes time. So in the meantime, we advise developers of security tools to model more than one version of the Windows loader, possibly asking the user um, which one to employ for their analysis. For their analysis. We believe that our language and framework is the reverse engineering effort to build these models. And that's the reason for which we um, release everything as open source, both the framework and the models. You can check it out our GitHub repository. All right, with that being said, my talk is concluded, so I will uh, gladly answer your questions if you happen to have any.